Team, so thrilled to have you. Um, we are here for our third and final webinar of this school year for the King County Green Schools program. And this year's, or excuse me, this afternoon's topic is social justice and sustainability. And we are really lucky to have a few folks with us here who are gonna have a great conversation with us and um, you all will have the opportunity to ask some questions of them. So we would like to start our time together today with a land acknowledgement. And uh, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people of the past and present. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and these indigenous people. And part of the reason we wanted to do a land acknowledgement is it's the right thing to do. And because all the things that we're talking about in terms of social justice and sustainability are very much rooted in the land and water itself. And in order for us to have good conversations about land and water, um, it's important to be rooted in context and history, you know, all the ways that our political and social worlds inform how we show up in this work. So I wanted to be sure and pause here. I also, if you're interested in this map, I'd be happy to share it with folks later on. It not only has names of tribes and territories, but also languages that are spoken in those areas. Thanks, Jen. Alrighty, so simple plan for today. We're almost finished with our welcome. We'll do some introductions and then we'll get to hear our panelists' voices instead of my voice for the whole time. And then we'll do a little closing at the end, give a lot more affirmations to our panelists and say thank you to them for their time. We'll do the next slide, Jen. Thank you. So there are a lot of us King County Green Schools representative folks here today. We are happy to help you. We are stoked to be around and supporting you and your student teams, or if you're a student, we're rad. We're rad. We are excited to be supporting your rad work because we know you all are doing good things. Um, I'm Ashley. Hello. I am also joined by my colleague Vivian and Jen and Stevie is here today. Um, and our program manager from King County, Dale, is also with us. Thanks, Jen. Next slide. Wonderful. So again, we are teachers. We are committed to our, our goals. Want to make sure folks have an idea of, of kind of where we're headed. So um, we have invited these three awesome folks here to kind of help us all make connections to local and regional leaders who work on social justice and sustainability projects. Um, to help us all have an increased understanding, increased consciousness of social justice and sustainability from the perspective of these folks. And then ideas and recommendations for student leaders, teachers, other school staff, district staff, on how we integrate these ideas of social justice and sustainability. All right, there they are. It's so exciting to see them. So I am going to now ask our panelists to introduce themselves and um, I will call on each of you in turn so that we don't have to guess who's going to go. Um, and I would love it if you can share your name, your pronouns if you would like, and then a project right now that you are feeling excited about. Um, social justice, sustainability, any combination of those. So let's start with Nellie. Can you start us off? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nellie. I use she and they pronouns. Um, I am the Nature Connections Program Manager at Young Women Empowered, also known as YWE, and I focus on farming and food justice. And a little bit about YWE, our mission is to cultivate the power of diverse young women to be courageous change makers in their communities, and we center youth of color in our work. Um, I'll share more about these projects, but what's giving me life right now is just holding programming uh, with young people at Mara Farm in South Park, um, talking about these issues of environmental um, and food justice in a very embodied way with our hands um, on the land, in the dirt, and um, being in community with them has been really special. Thank you. All right, let's go to Emily next. Hi, thank you for having me. That was a great introduction, Ashley. I'm like laughing over here the whole time. Um, my name is Emily Pinckney. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I wear a couple different hats. Um, one of my hats is I work on this conservation leadership development program with Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, as well as Northwest Trek. A lot of the work that I try to do is center the voices of those who are underrepresented in zoo, aquarium, but also nature and outdoor spaces, but center those voices in the conversations. And then, you know, help develop our next conservation leaders. But I really 
really don't have to help because those leaders, those young folks are actually really awesome already. I just kind of take away some of those barriers and then just, you know, give a couple of praises and affirmations, like Ashley said, to like help them with their trail. But yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. There's a couple of projects that are going on right now that I'll, you know, talk more about, but a huge one that we're working on right now is actually creating more pride centered events, but also creating more of an accessible space within our zoo and aquarium as well as Northwest Trek. So yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. And then Orion. Oh, well, thank you, Ashley, Emily, uh, Noah. Thank you so much for being here and sharing that little context with folks. Uh, my name is Orion Grant. Preferred pronouns are they and him. Um, I'm currently a program director here at the Environmental Science Center, and I'm also kind of a executive director, you could say, or at least um, a coordinator with uh, Black Star Farmers as well as Ujama Food Circle. Um, so. To step back, the Environmental Science Center focuses on outdoor education, particularly K through 12, um, for traditionally underserved BIPOC youth here in Burien, uh, South Seattle, in the Renton area. Uh, when I'm not, you know, fully committed to this work with our field studies and kind of with our uh, career building, I'm working with Ujama Food Circle as well as Black Star Farmers to expand and build that capacity for uh, that BIPOC farming network and sustainable food justice network in Seattle. So. Yeah, we'll touch on all this stuff soon. Can't wait to get started. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. We are truly grateful to have some great folks here with us today. And I'm really grateful, express gratitude to all of our participants who have arrived here today. Um, I know that these are strange and intense times we're living in environmentally, socially, uh, mentally. So thank you for setting aside a little time today to engage and to think about these topics that are that are really important and really integral to all of the sustainability work that I know our students and teachers are committed to. All right, Jen, next slide, please. Thank you. So as we dive into listening and learning and engaging with content about sustainability and social justice, um, it's important to our team and um, important for me as a teacher also to kind of set some norms, classroom norms, expectations for folks about um, ways we can engage and, and talk with each other today. So we ask for all of the folks who are joining us to treat one another with respect, understand that unequal systems exist, avoid assumptions or generalizations about social groups, be mindful of intent and impact, and speak from your own experience. And with that, let's roll, let's do this. So um, I am gonna trust all of our panelists team to unmute at will. Um, I can call on you in order if you'd like, or you all can popcorn to respond to these questions, um, but we would love to hear, is there a person movement, mentor, or spark moment that inspired you to be involved with social justice and sustainability. I can also be the teacher and call on folks if you want. <laughs> I trust you. You all can unmute. That's, that's all right, Ashley. I think we can jump. Um, we had the chance to communicate prior to and think about this first question specifically. Uh, when did this start? Um, what was a name we can put to the kind of process of coming to sustainability as a practice? Um, each one of us, I think, had a very dynamic and different way that we've come to this work and how it's embodied, uh, not only our uh, desire to impact our communities and impart knowledge, but also to do it actionably and measurably in some cases. Um, so in brief, I think, you know, all of us have come to this by degrees and out of necessity from what I heard in our prior conversation. So I won't speak for everybody else, but, um, in my context, I think sustainability as a practice and as a means of um, kind of mitigating certain damages that have been done, particularly on BIPOC communities, um, it, it seems like the logical next step as we continue to advance our communities, as we continue to connect and uh, communicate the need for um, systemic change, um, infrastructure improvement, uh, looking through a sustainable lens, uh, just it frames things in a way that grants us, I think, a little bit more um, objection and gives us a chance to see our future in a more tangible way uh, together. So just some context for all of us, I think sustainability as it relates to BIPOC communities um, might be different than definitions that folks are expecting or be, might be more comfortable with. So I really appreciate you, Ashley, by framing this conversation first around the fact that our experiences, though, um, defined and um, similar 
um, are not always the same. And it really is important to start this conversation thinking about sustainability as it relates to the longevity of BIPOC communities. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll, I'll let Emily. Thanks, Orion. Yeah, I was going to say, Orion, I thank you for um, bringing up that fact that like it kind of was necessity. Um, I mean, I know for me, like when I was a kid, I was like, I'm going to be a marine biologist. I love the ocean so much. I just love these little animals on the beach, would go down there as often as I could. My mom and I would walk down to Titlo every single day and just go play out on the beach. And I always just had a love for the ocean and appreciation. So I was like, I'm going to go to school and be a marine biologist. Easy. So I decided that that was going to be my path. And the more I started to do that, I realized that folks who looked like me were not there. They weren't the folks researching with me. They weren't the folks at the universities I was at. They weren't in those spaces. But then when I would look at the news or see some of the work that my dad did, he cleaned up environmental hazardous waste. I saw the work that he did and everyone looked like us. And so I think that it's kind of one of those things where social justice, it just happened to be the thing that would help solve climate change. I think a lot of times when we look at climate change, we treat it with these symptomatic things like, you know, doing these small campaigns, a lot of them starting from these suburb communities and those are the ones that get funding. But I think nowadays a lot of folks are starting to realize truly what like environmental justice means, understanding that we need to get to a lot of the root causes of that. And a lot of those causes come from these places and spaces where folks of color and folks who are in low income communities are being attacked by the, the pollution the most, but aren't having their voices heard. And so I think that the more I started to realize that I was like, wait, a lot of folks have a story to tell and they're not able to tell it. I'm going to use the privilege that I know that I have now that I've been through the university system now that I've been able to learn some of these facts and equip my community to be able to, you know, fight climate change and to be able to speak and to be able to be at the table and participate in the conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Thank you both so much for sharing. Um, yeah, I my journey to this work has definitely been maybe an unconventional one or a winding one. I didn't start knowing that um, my place, my life's work was around these issues of environmental justice. Um, so I am one of three daughters of Indian Punjabi um, immigrant parents and growing up their central focus for us was education as a means to reach financial stability and independence, which is something that they didn't have growing up. And um, so my path was very, looking back, very narrow, very focused um, around academics. Um, and I'm so grateful for their investment. I'm grateful for my brain um, and um, at the age of 22, I recognized I had kind of reached their American dream for me. I was working in tech marketing. Um, and at that point, I asked myself, you know, I've reached their dream for me, but what is my dream for me? I think I'd asked that question in the past, but wasn't really ready to listen to the answer. Um, and I just knew at that point, I was very disconnected from my true self, disconnected from my values and my passions. Um, and while I had invested so much in my brain, I was very disembodied from my own body and from the earth and the environment that grounds me, that holds me. Um, and around that time, I also started developing chronic pain in my body. And I was like, okay, something has to change. Um, and I started asking myself, what's the opposite of what I'm doing right now? I'm sitting inside with no windows all day, staring at a computer screen, um, disconnected kind of to my values and passions. And so a friend actually recommended I um, check out Mara Farm in South Park. And I started volunteering with solid ground there and just, um, you know, as an urban farmhand, just tending to the land, helping grow food there. And at that point, I could feel, I could just really feel in my body and in my heart, like this is what feels good. Um, this is where my joy comes alive. This, alive. this is where I feel aligned. Um, and while I was out there, I actually met um, Chanel Donaldson, who um, was working with Solid Ground at the time. And she is 
uh, the, the founder of Percussion Farms and the farm manager at the U, U District Food Bank. She's incredible. And so we were talking and she sort of uh, started making the connection for me that I'd never made before of the significance of, of us as um, people of color doing this work, growing food with the land. Um, many people who are part of diaspora um, have experienced trauma at the side of the land, whether that's personally or ancestrally. And it is um, not only are we growing, you know, just the beauty of growing food and tending to the land, we are, it's a radical act of healing, of self-determination for our communities to be able to do this work. Um, and then I was like, whoa, this is, this is it. This is it for me. Um, this is my life's work. And I'm so grateful um, with why we have gotten to kind of share that opportunity with young people to ask themselves these questions and be listening to the, their real answers and to um, kind of go find that healing journey for themselves. Um, and I was also, I think kind of, I, I appreciated Emily when we were talking previously, you were like, it's, it's about the people. So I mentioned like Chanel Donaldson, Scott at the farm, like all the, the community in South Park, um, they've taught me so much and I'm grateful for them, but also the land itself has been um, a teacher for me, like Mara Farm. I happened to go there for a volunteer day in 2013 before I even moved to Seattle. Seattle, when I went back there to work with Solid Ground, I was like, oh, I've been here before. And then when I started working at YWE, they were like, we have a grant for us to start tending a plot at Mara Farm, and you're going to lead that. And that just felt like this kismet, this like the universe was pulling me to this place. And I feel very grateful. Um, yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Nellie. Emily and O'Ryan, anything else you'd like to add? before we keep going. Great. I want to honor, uh, as we transition to our next question, the vulnerability that you all just shared of the places that you've been, both in your bodies and your in your spirits and in your minds, right? I think that um, that's a really, really excellent reminder for us um, to keep bringing those ideas and keep bringing those connections into our sustainability work. So thank you for, for grounding us and being vulnerable with the folks who are here today. Um, I want to remind our participants that if you are thinking of questions while you're listening to um, Nellie, Orion, and Emily speak today, please feel free to pop those in the chat. Um, we will be keeping track of those and we've got some time set aside um, here towards the end uh, for folks to ask the questions that you've got. Um, so please feel free to put those in there. And if you feel brave and willing to ask your question yourself, let us know. We would, we would love that. And I think our, our panelist team would like that as well. So you all got a little taste of this from the last question, um, which is the beauty of these questions. They all sort of blend together. But um, we would love to hear a little bit more about kind of the application of these really lovely vulnerable things you shared with us about um, necessity and um, entering into this work in a way that feels good, not just in your brain and in your heart, but in your body too. So if you all can tell us um, how are social justice and sustainability part of the projects that you work on? And any crossover, because I heard a couple of notes of like, oh, I know this person or I've done a thing, so have at. <laughs> Go for it, whoever's feeling brave. Just to jump in real quick, folks. Um, so to answer this question, it's a really awesome question for us, Ashley, and I'd like for our, our guests who are here listening to us to really kind of divorce themselves from how sustainability might look in, in their mind's eye and think about this in a little bit more of a, um, I think of a more actionable way. So, so for us um, to be directed and led by our community uh, means intrinsically that we are a part of a social justice movement. Um, going back to Nellie's point, uh, echoing Emily again about the fact that names are the reasons why we are here. And it's the people that have brought us to this work. It's the uh, folks that have reminded us how important this justice is. It's the folks who are continuing to meet and the relationships we're hoping to foster together um, that re reimagine and um, 
I'd say definitely reinforce the necessity to continue to do this type of work um, centered around food justice and centered around um, communities of color. So I think another word that I'd like to use a lot in uh, businesses capacity building, and um, although this is more of a metric that we use to kind of measure success over, over time or to see a, a, a point down the road, I'd like to think about our communities as something that are continuing to be improved upon, continuing to be nurtured, um, something that we are stewarding into the future. So for us, uh, this kind of element of sustainability and how it overlaps, it can't be divorced. We can't separate these two things. So they are one. Um, and in doing so, uh, you know, through practice, through communication, through, um, I think, real measurable change, I, I see not only our community coming together in, in ways that I never would have imagined, but I, I hear stories, um, a lot like Nellie's story, where it feels right. And it feels like this type of work in the way that it's, it's healing our soul um, is bringing us back to um, our humanity. So, um, yeah, I think that the sustainability for us is defined by those regenerative practices, that regenerative nature of being close to the soil, being close to the earth and being quiet in that way. Um, I think in, in its own way that is healing, um, in its own way that is uh, therapy. And uh, if we have therapy like that for our communities of color especially, uh, I think healing that's been going on generationally, um, we can start to dismantle some of that and identify some of those uh, deep-seated traumas. So I've spoken enough, I'd really love to hear Emily and uh, Nellie on this. Yeah, uh, thanks, Orion. I feel like I'm like I feel like I'm just like echoing a lot of this same energy. But I feel like we all are on this panel for that reason exactly because there's there's a place that you get to in terms of understanding that like part of what we're doing here is to heal the trauma in these places, and then also centering the voices who have not been in the spaces. And I feel like I see that in a lot of the projects I'm working on right now. And a huge part of that is acknowledging the trauma first. So acknowledging what happened, what took place in the space, because if we don't, we're completely erasing the folks who've been there, who've been doing the work, by the way. There's a lot of these communities that we're bringing into conversations who have actually been doing the work for a very long time. We just haven't seen them. We haven't celebrated them. We haven't talked to them. We don't amplify their voices. And when we do have things like funding or resources, we do not share them. Those communities are resilient because they found and built systems within themselves to be able to try and continue that. That's why they're the best folks to come to when it comes to regenerative, regenerative practices the way that Orion's talking about. That's why they're so resilient. That's why we're still here, even though white supremacy has tried to wipe out different groups, especially groups from communities of color or whether they're low income communities. Right now, like I was saying earlier, I'm working on a lot of projects around pride in nature spaces and in wildlife spaces, talking about things like queer ecology, the way in which we've looked at ecology forever has been very binary. And that's just detrimental to the work that we're doing. And then also thinking about the things that took place on this land, especially in the Pacific Northwest when it comes to certain communities and how they were treated, making sure that those voices are in our conversations, Make, making sure that for instance, like, you know, when I'm going to the zoo, making sure that our bathrooms are gender inclusive, that everybody can see themselves in that space. And understanding too, that the climate justice movement can't be led with just folks in positions of power and privilege, because those are the folks that benefit from climate change. And so making sure that everyone is a part of that conversation is very, very important. And then, like I said, healing that trauma. And that can be a bunch of different things. I think a lot of time too, we do get in a very doom and gloom conversation, but there's so much to celebrate when it comes to social justice. There's so much to celebrate when you have diversity in a room. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but when I'm in very diverse spaces, it's always a celebration. We're always celebrating the earth. We're celebrating each other. We're celebrating the land that we're on and the life that we live. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. I appreciate so much what you just said, Emily, and you, Orion. Um, I feel like, yeah, I don't want to, I feel like you said it perfectly and beautifully. And I think just the um, one thing I'll echo is just when I was thinking about social justice and sustainability, it's like you can't have one without the other, knowing that. Um, the way that our systems are set up, they are extracting and violating not only our planet, but our people. 
and it's it is unsustainable and it's by design that way um, for those um, in power to hoard wealth and resources and so like by design like sustainability is not a part of that um, system in the way that it's built and so I think that's really at the core of what of the work that I do with YWE and the youth um, at Mara Farm in particular of if there is racism and injustice in our food systems, how can we, like Emily said, understand uh, the history of the land we're on, Mara Farm in particular, there's just layers and layers and layers and layers of history on this land in itself. And we, we go through that with our young people um, of understanding you know, that um, South Park experiences food apartheid, a lack of access to fresh, healthy food that's disproportionately affecting um, immigrant communities of color and understanding like who has been um, contributing and a part of this land's resi resilience, um, honoring the Duwamish and Coast Salish, Salish people, understanding that their village is just like within a couple miles of Mara Farm, their ancestral village. Um, talking about the Filipino and um, Japanese farmers who are tending the land there, which happens to be one of the oldest remaining pieces of farmland in King County. Um, the Japanese and Filipino farmers who were there before um, internment, before they were forced off that land. Um, learning about the Italian farmers who, uh, you know, actually started Pike's Place Market um, growing food at Mara Farm. Um, and that was the first food, you know, sold at Pike's Place Market. So we under, we, we first, like off the bat, just understand um, those layers of history and then um, honoring also just the fact that South Park has been a place where immigrants and refugee communities have um, always been breathing life into that neighborhood. Um, so honoring their, their brilliance and wisdom within um, reshaping our food systems as well. Um, so just understanding that broader context is so important to what we do. And then um, some of our other goals there are just to be in reciprocal connection and relationship with ourselves, each other and the environment. I'm gonna kind of walk through the goals of our, of our programs to just highlight where social justice and sustainability come up for us. So um, when we talk about healing, a lot of our youth, especially amidst, um, pandemic amidst social justice and racial justice uprising over um, resurgence, they needed space. And we were so grateful that we could hold space at Mara Farm for them, for just their nervous systems to just chill out, for them to be in relationship with each other, but also to turn to like plant and, and nature allies for healing when so much of what they were doing was in verbal conversation on social media, like they needed um, I think Orion, you talked about like just that quiet that you can, that quiet uh, relationship that you can hold with the land for healing. Um, so that's a that's a huge um, focus for us. Like I said, disrupting environmental racism and injustice in our food systems and learning about what that looks like. And then also in practice, we talk about what are skills for interdependence that we want to build together so that we can, um, yeah build our own systems outside of those extractive, uh, extractive systems. So we start with just these skills of growing food, um, but also we are learning about food preservation. We're learning about plant medicine, um, building raised beds, doing uh, creek restoration. And, you know, they're just a little taster to these different skills. But for me, the big idea is like, uh, yeah, let's let's build our own houses. Let's have our own, you know. Let's let's um, tend to our own land and feed our own people. Like that's this is just the start with the young people, and it's, um, yeah, we're building bigger sisters systems from these first steps. And then we also, our goal is to just love on community and participate in mutual aid. And so we donate all of the food um, to community locally into the YWE community. And so we're participating in the pantry system that was started by neighbors in South Park. Um, and also to you know, the food bank, the senior center, 
uh, in South Park, the CMAR Community Health Clinic. And then we're also this year um, sharing uh, small, small container gardens um, so that we can support our community in growing their own home and just, yeah, just trying it, just starting it out and then seeing where we go from there. Uh, yeah. I feel like I left my body for a little bit while I was listening to you all. I was like, oh, this is transcendental. It's, it's really amazing to, to have the three of you in conversation. Before we, we put up our third question, Emily, Orion, Nelly, anything else you'd like to add or share before we keep going? Great. All righty, let's do it. Uh, remember folks, I feel like a little bit of a, a, a field reporter. Remember, you can put your questions in the chat if you have a question or if you would like to hold it in your heart until you're ready to share, that's okay too. Um, we have uh, a little bit of a transition question is how I would describe it. Um, obviously, one of the goals of the King County Green Schools program is to help students kind of find their footing in this world of sustainability and social justice and how does that sit with them and where does it live and does it live everywhere does it live in you know your i don't know your ears or your toes you know finding where it fits and i am so grateful to the three of you for again sharing how this fits into your universe and i would love to hear your ideas about a way students can help to advance these social justice efforts, or excuse me, advance social justice in their sustainability work, right? I've What I've heard is that they are one and the same. And so maybe drawing on your own experiences and some of the great work that I know your organizations are doing that you've shared with us, um, you know, if you could if you could give your young self advice, if you can give uh, our teachers and folks who are here today who work with young people, um, what would that be? Okay, I'm gonna go first this time. Sorry, Orion, I really like this question. <laughs> also, cause I do work with a lot of youth. Um, I love the kids, they're my favorite. I think there's a couple things. So in terms of the, I would say the advice that I would give a young person is, um, and this is something that I've really been talking a lot about with folks. And I know I shared it with uh, Nelly and uh, Ryan last week, but this abundance versus scarcity model in terms of people power, in terms of what you can be and what you can do and having this, uh, this idea that there's abundant options and abundant things for you to be able to do and participate in. I think, especially when it comes to young folks, you know, there's always this, this idea idea that only so many people can be a part of a movement or only somebody can be highlighted or only one person or one voice can be amplified but really what we've seen especially and I love to look at the youth climate led movement the whole world stopped we all stopped and looked at these young folks marching in the streets and I always remind young folks how powerful they can be and I think a lot of the things that I like to do with my students is there is never a project that I'm going to lead and tell the students what to do every single project that I do with all the young folks I work with is their project they lead it every single time I let them know the resources I have I let them know organizations to reach out to I literally give them my entire Rolodex I'm like here are all the people I know I went out of my way to meet all these people from the governor all the way down to every single school teacher so that you could have that resource because at the end of the day youth I mean I'm going to tell you right now I'm starting to lose energy I'm getting exhausted they have a lot of it and they're also really passionate. And I think what ends up happening is, you know, when we start to get older and go through these movements, I mean, I've had a lot of the elders in my community say, Emily, make sure you store some of that energy because you're gonna get tired. You're gonna get weighed down. You're gonna get bogged down with some of the pressure. There's gonna be a lot on you. And so what I wanna do is make sure that I just repair that leaky pipeline and make sure that th those barriers are out of the way because I know all the barriers that I had to go through and there's no way that I want anyone else to have to go through those in order to do something good for our world. I'm like, these kids just wanna bring something beautiful to the world. They wanna fight climate change and they wanna share that message with other people. And so the last thing I wanna do is be another one of those obstacles. So I'm like, okay, let me equip you with the entire tool bag because I don't need to empower you. I just need to recognize the power you already have. And so I think that that's what we need to focus on with these young folks. Like one of my favorite things, I'm always like, look at all these politicians. We hired them to do a job. Here are their addresses. Here's their phone numbers. Here's where you can locate them. Send the letters here because at the end of the day, we need to keep them accountable. And if we can't, then we can fire them. 
that's how election cycles work. So I always try to make sure they know where all those different tools and resources are, and then try to also show them like other organizations and other work that folks are doing, like what Nellie and Orion are doing is awesome. And I have so many young folks, this is not a plug, but this is definitely a plug, who are volunteers who would love to look for work this summer. So if y'all need any young folks, I know a lot of young people doing it. And I think, um, especially for the adults in the room, when we hear a young person talk about the things they're passionate about, totally amplifying that and finding the resources for them and then showing them how to find it themselves. Because I think a lot of times, you know, say that you're a biology teacher and then you have a student who likes to talk about their love of cooking. We will not like, you know, acknowledge that student or we stop talking about it or whatever it is. And we shut that down a little bit. I mean, I taught for a while. I know how exhausting it can be and how many awesome kids you can have and how, you know, spread you can be among trying to make sure all their dreams come true. And so trying to be able to help them to find those resources on their own. And like I said, recognizing their power has been one of the most useful tools for me. I can share a little bit. I just, Emily, when you're talking, I just, I'm like making audible noises. I'm like, thank God I'm on mute that people, I'm just like, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Yes, um, I think I think this is aligned with what you're saying, Emily, but when I was just thinking about this question in my own journey of just my hope for young people is that they can, that inner voice inside of them, whether you call it intuition, their true authentic self, I feel like for me very quickly, I was taught to question that, to undermine it, to, um, to compromise it for the adults around me, for the systems that I was within, whether it was school or work. And a big, like, a big reason why I do this work and why I find, um, why I'm energized at YWE because they, we all share this value is just how can we cultivate that inner voice that exists within every person um, and at a young age so that they can honor themselves and listen to themselves in a way that I, I realized much later. Um, and I think also the importance of finding spaces and people and communities that also honor that voice within you. Um, not to say we should all go into our own worlds and, and not celebrate differences. Actually, a lot of, for me and at YWE, a lot of the spaces we cultivate our, there's so many differences and we honor those differences. That's the biodiversity that creates health in our ecosystems. Um, and by honoring those different voices, we can actually find belonging. It's not um, a homogenous. We're not looking for hom homogeneity. And so I know that kind of sounds abstract and maybe cheesy, but just like find your inner voice, listen to it, find the people and spaces that support you in doing that so that um, you can tap into that inner power that Emily is talking about. Um, and a lot of also what we talk about with young people is just, uh, we talk, a lot of what I do in my work is also just finding metaphor in everything that we do. <laughs> so looking at the metaphor of a plant, a tree, doesn't have to be anything but themselves to be in service of the, our, their ecosystem. Um, and how can we, um, and them as young people, how can they just look at what natural gifts that they have, what natural interests and passions that they have, and don't have to contort themselves to what they think they need to be in order to be the activist or the social, you know, the epitome of social justice. Like it looks different for every single one of us. Um, so I think that's important. And the other pieces, and I, I'm going to see how I think to speak or, you know, speak to think this idea out, but just, you know, doing inner work. And I, I guess all of what I'm saying applies to youth and adults of, you know, growing up with, you know, within this model minority uh, myth, within this myth of meritocracy of, um, you know, as an immigrant family, we keep our head down, we look out for each other, we have gotten to where we are because we've worked, it's, it's a product of how hard we've worked. Um, and it's all through our own merit. And 
yes, we've worked hard. And within this white supremacy, uh, you know, context we're in, you know, my family in particular has this narrow window where we are able to find success um, and monetary success that a lot of communities don't have access to. And so by saying, oh, it's just a product of our hard work, but not recognizing how the system is actually um, benefiting us, like that's that's the work that I've, you know, a, a glimpse of the work that I've had to do. And I think we each, depending on our positionalities, have to do that work to understand, again, what are our gifts, but also like, what role do I play in the, in the movement? And I think without doing, those two pieces of work and other things like acting before you do that work can actually be harmful to yourself and to others. And so um, rather than jumping to, to doing something to action, like actually that inner work, that healing is uh, necessary to have meaningful action that's actually doing what you're trying to do is what, what I'll say. <laughs> Uh, Emily, Nelly, I just am so grateful to be able to speak after y'all. It's just, um, it's just encompassing of everything that I'm doing. And it's great to be reminded that uh, there's a like-mindedness through our community. So I'm just grateful to be here with both of y'all. I just want to say that really quick. Um, to answer this question as concisely as I can, one way students can um, improve or create social change um, through sustainability is by showing up. So our students, especially BIPOC students in particular, they bring with them experiences, identities, um, powers, some privileges that are in general in invisible and others that they can't, they can't hide. So it, it really comes back to um, kind of flipping this question on its head we need to think and recognize deeply about the power um, that these youth and that young folks are bringing to the table already. Um, we need to navigate those conversations with respect and mindfulness of what they've come from um, and the struggles that they've gone through uh, to get in front of us now. Um, and I think lastly, to kind of acknowledge that intersection um, and to honor that identity, um, I think in that way, that empowers and um, ignites our students to be exactly what they need to be, uh, to come to this work, to change the scope of our communities, to change how sustainability looks and how the practice actually impacts communities of color. Um, so one really awesome takeaway from our last conversation, Emily and uh, Nelly, you know, what, what can we glean and how much can we glean from hope, which I think was really brilliant. And I, I'd like to leave that really quickly on the table. How much can our students, how much can young folks show us just by showing up? Um, and if we're listening and doing that internal work, not only to divorce ourselves from biases and to acknowledge our identity, um, if we're doing that work before they get there, uh, then we have a much better chance of seeing them for who they are and giving them a chance to be successful um, and lead in their own way. So yeah, that's all I've got for that one. Good question. Thank you all. Again, just this sort of uh, really lovely transcendent feeling. I don't know if anybody else is feeling that way. <laughs> I certainly am. Um, I am excited to uh, have the opportunity now for folks to kind of be noodling and integrating on uh, ideas that you all have shared. I have written down a few things of like, oh, I'm not exactly sure what that is. I'm gonna need to go do some research. So I hope that you all are have your have your ears on and your hearts open and are kind of soaking this up, uh, this really lovely conversation. Um, we would love to hear from folks who are with us today. Um, Jen, if you would stop screen sharing for a minute, that way we can see each other a little bit better. And if you wanna stop um, spotlighting too, that'd be great. So we can see folks in a big old grid. And if you uh, wanna see more people on your screen, you can go up to the top right hand corner and click on gallery view. Um, we'll mix it up. If you would like to turn on your camera, you are quite welcome to, but certainly not obligated. Um, and we've got some space for, uh, questions for, for our awesome panelists who are here. So you can 
submit them in the chat if you don't want to ask them yourself, or you can raise your hand. Happy to call on you. I taught like 80 middle schoolers earlier, so I'm ready, ready for it, ready for whatever questions you've got. And if you don't have questions, I have some extras. Yes, yes, yes. We'll give folks a moment. Ashley, would you mind telling people how they can raise their hand if they're not oh. on camera? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Jen. This is why this is why we takes a village. Um, if you would like to raise your hand, if you hover over to your participant list on the right hand side of your computer screen or your tablet, you can see um, a little more. Um, you might also see above your little chat bubble a, a little like hand raising button. Um, I trust you all. You can also come off of mute and I will just pay attention to who's off of mute and you can share your questions if you'd like. I see more faces, more cameras turning on. It's the awkward teacher silence. I'll sing a song. I could sing Dolly Parton. This is what I usually sing while I wait for folks. Working that to five. <clears throat> All right, y'all. Give folks another minute. Your question can be can be any sort of question. I, I trust you all to bring your questions to the space in a way that feels right to you. I hope this conversation wasn't too nebulous. But, you know, these are seems like second nature to Emily and to Nellie, but I know some of this stuff is, is new conversation for folks. So um, please don't feel like it needs to be framed around exactly what we've been talking about. It can be something about yeah. ecology, sustainability, uh, anything really. We're just happy to be here with you all. Thanks, Orion. Crystal, did you want to ask your question out loud or, or can I read it for you? It's a good one. My my fan is on, so it might be okay. kind of loud. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay, I'm outside, so I'm. you did not pull me out of the sunshine. Um, <laughs> Good. So, um, I have an amazing green team, but uh, that's really interested in social justice and sustainability. So what would be some good projects you guys would suggest for our green team? For context for our panelists, green teams are like clubs at our schools who do this work. I figured you could. Thank you. That, yeah. I was going to say, I can speak on that a bit. So I'm actually on uh, the green team at Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium. So I'm on a green team too. Love so, that. Right? Isn't that awesome? So I'm like, I saw that. I was like, oh, did we have a green team meeting today or something that I'm in? <laughs> but um, I mean, right now, so for what, so for what we're doing is we are kind of using the tools and resources and things that we have, and then trying to connect with our community and then also work within our space. So technically Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium is within the city of Tacoma. And we were like, okay, what are some projects that like the city of Tacoma has that we can amplify and then help in other places of the community that they're not reaching? So like one of the programs that they have right now is there's this huge tree planting program. And um, the kind of the way in which they have the tree planting program is that like, for instance, folks can just come and pick up a tree you can get a tree for free and you can plant it and they'll come to your house and show you how to plant it. But that's a lot of accessibility that's not addressed. Not everyone can just come pick up a tree. Not everyone can just like plan, the, you know, times in their day to go plant it. So part of what we're doing is we're going out and planting those trees as a green team. And this is very much a, like a ragtag effort. Like these are just employees of the zoo. This isn't something that we're like on officially doing. This is something we're doing because we want to do it. And because as a green team, it's something that we have the, the time and privilege to be able to do. And then we can just connect with community members. And so we're doing the tree planting program with the folks that are in the community that maybe necessarily can't go pick it up or can't install it themselves and put it in their house. And so, yeah, that's one of the ways that we're doing that. And then also seeing again, what kind of programs are going on within the county so like one of the programs that's going on right now is like these air sensor programs where they're putting air sensors all over the community and the University of Washington is culminating that data and then just looking at the air quality in the area, but they just want to have more information and more data points. So part of what we're doing is because we have the time and energy to do it is we're going and putting those things out in different places in the community where they are not. And also in places where we know that there's, you know, some increases in respiratory illnesses or like increases in asthma and trying to just be conscious of like 
the intent around how we're doing it. There's so many awesome like conservation projects, awesome things you can do in your community. And I think a lot of it's not necessarily the project, but the intent behind the project. And then who's helping do the project with you. Thank you. I'm going to stack on the end of that, Emily. It's just a phenomenal outline. Um, for us, it's as simple as, you know, talking to the community and listening to folks who either we have immediate connections with or partners that we would like to, you know, strengthen relationships with. It's going to start with that. And, you know, although a green team isn't an equity council or a diversity team, the more you get into conversations with your community, especially communities of color, you start to see that these conversations about sustainability and environmental science and environmental service, they start to lean into that. So um, yeah, look, look to your community to help guide you in that way, to, to find where the energy or where the need may, might be most. Um, that can make some of that groundwork a little bit easier um, and much more intentional, so. Ditto to what Emily and Orion said. I was going to say the, a similar thing to Orion of, of, yeah, talk to your community. And I think, um, yeah, with so social justice in mind and like what communities you're hoping to center, like making, you know, ensuring or uh, reducing barriers for those folks to have their voices heard and be in leadership. And if um, your group, uh, if you're hoping to um, support, you know, marginalized community, whether it's community of color or, um, you know, any community really, if if that's not represented in your group, like, yeah, being in relationship with groups outside of yours to say, what are the needs and how we can support? And like one example is, um, you know, I, I one example in my life is I um, also do some organizing work with Got Green and. Uh, we do some partnership with groups like Resource Generation that, um, you know, are, it's an organizing group of folks with wealth, um, access to wealth. And so they do a lot of like fundraising for the work that Got Green does so that they can do, you know, the work for and by their community. So, um, yeah, talking to, to friends. <laughs> Thank you. That is wonderful. All right, y'all. If anybody else pops anything in the chat, I will pause. Um, but I am going to um, carry us to um, a little bit of a closing here momentarily because it's 4.57. The time just poof, went right, right on by. Um, now would be a great time for um, all of our participants who are here today uh, to give some sort of affirmation. You can use uh, your emoji reactions. Those are along the bottom of your screen. Um, if you are a person who does not have emojis, totally fine. You can give an affirmation in the chat. I am also going to be a wild teacher and ask you if you want to come off of mute and like, woohoo, if you feel like it. So. We have 10 seconds for affirmations. Ready? Go. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Keep going. You can just affirm for the rest of just affirm, affirm forever, right? We're all middle schoolers in our hearts. We just want to push the heart button again and again. Yes, panelists, can you see the chat? If you can't, look at all those lovely things. Yes, please keep affirming these lovely humans. Wonderful. All right, y'all. <clears throat> I have one last thing I would like to share. We have just a teensy, teensy bit of uh, announcements that we want to share with folks. So we'll, we will do this and then I have, I have a little have a little closing that I did for us. So uh, Vivian, take it away with our last little set of announcements and then I'm happy to be spotlighted, but there we go. <laughs> go for yeah. it, Vivian. Um, I just wanna again affirm and thank the panelists. That was really inspiring um, and lots of great advice and, and a lot to noodle on. Um, so looking ahead, I'm just gonna briefly mention we're coming up towards the end of the school year and a lot of 
what we're looking at is celebrating the work that all the students and you as well have been doing under um, unusual circumstances. And so we're going to be giving green teams recognition. And if you've been working with students, um, keep an eye out for a survey that's going to get sent in early May. Um, your students can also get recognized uh, at a June 9th celebration that's going to be coming up. A link to this webinar, as Ashley mentioned earlier, is going to be sent up afterwards. So if you want to share this with other folks, uh, there's also going to be an, one more activity sheet coming up and there's one more day left in the Earth Month Sustainability Challenge. And so I realized that that's um, a very high level view of what's left for the school year. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your representative. Great. Thank you, Vivian. All right, Jen, if, uh, yeah, we want to stop our uh, spotlight. I have one last thing for us. So I wrote down a whole bunch of words uh, while we were talking and listening and um, so I wrote a little haiku. So we, uh, part of our Earth Month challenge for students has been writing haikus. So I wrote a haiku for you all. Abundant healing, regenerative quiet, honor inner voice. 